Hey everybody, this is your host Yoshino with artist and painter Mia Bergeron. And before we begin this episode, I want to give a shout out to our sponsors. Our first sponsor is No Wave Academy. And Mia Bergeron actually just put out a online workshop through No Wave Academy. You can go check out their website, nowaveacademy.com. That's N-O-H Wave Academy. Com. They offer multiple courses from various fine artists, such as Daniel Bilnis, David Chaffetz, Paul Christina, Steve Kim, Nick Rungi, Daniel Seagrove, John Wentz, Kate Zambrano, and many more. So go to nohwaveacademy.com, type in AD10 at checkout for 10% off. That's AD10 for 10% off. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by art supply company, Savoir Fair, in conjunction with Sennelier Oil Paints and Isabi Brushes. Here's what Mia Bergeron had to say about the use of Sennelier Oil Paints, as well as Isabi Brushes, when she utilized them for the online workshop that she did for No Wave Academy. So I really loved the Sennelier Oil Paints, particularly the more opaque colors. They have sort of that, um, there's like a stringiness to them that's a little bit like a lead paint that a lot of artists love, but it's not just in the white. Like the manganese blue is really beautiful. All their kind of opaque colors, uh, the cadmium yellow lemon, those colors tend to be like super strong, which I really, really liked. Um, Sometimes it's nice to just have something that's really chromatic. They're actually a little bit more chromatic than a lot of other paints. So a little bit goes a longer way. So I find that they're kind of, they sort of make up for like any, how should I say this? Like they're a good value for what they are because I think they have like a lot more usage. Just like the application of them tends to go on really kind of buttery in a way, which is really nice. Um, So yeah, so I really, really liked those paints a lot. Uh, And I also found that they just, they have a really strong tinting power. Again, so the longevity of using like a tube of paint will be kind of longer, I'm finding. Like usually I find myself going through a tube of cadmium red, like it takes me, I paint a lot and I paint a lot of flesh tones. So I tend to go through cadmium red pretty quickly. And I'm finding that I'm not even a quarter of the way through the tube that I got about, gosh, what was that, like three months ago, two months ago? So uh, really great quality. I really, really liked them. And then the the Isabi brushes, the Isabi memory brushes, I asked for the um, flat shape because they just, I tend to use a lot more flats and they are so great. I am really, really tough on my brushes and these ones tend to keep their shape really well. And I'm also pretty bad about washing my brushes. Like because I paint every day, I'll sort of rinse them out on a little bit of turpentine and then leave for the day. I don't actually like soap up my brushes. And what I found is that a lot of brushes when you, you know, you're dipping them in turp is like the last thing you do during the day. And so inevitably the bristles start to get eaten down very quickly. So I go through a lot of brushes and I've had these and I've been using them like just wearing them out and they are just keeping their shape really well. They have a really nice, strong, flat point on them that just keeps going back to its shape. So I'm sold on these. I love these so much. All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Please make sure to Leave us a review on iTunes. It helps for viewers just like yourself to hear about this podcast. And here it is, episode number 133 with artist and painter Mia Bergeron for Artists to Code. Hey everyone, how's it going? This is your host Yoshino and sitting in front of me is painter Mia Bergeron who studied at RISD, the Harvard Extension School, and Charles H. Cecil's studio in Florence, Italy. She recently had a solo exhibit entitled Outside In at Robert Lang's studio in Charleston, South Carolina. And yesterday, she filmed with us at No Wave, (laughs) doing a No Wave Academy online workshop. So now we're here, sitting here, 
at No Wave. Here we are. Yeah. Yeah, which was such a great experience yesterday. Yeah, well. It was awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We, <laughs> well, we, we appreciate uh, we appreciate you. And uh, yeah, I know you're a, you're a pleasure to work with. Thank you. You guys are too. Yeah. Highly recommend five stars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know. Seriously, I love these guys. Yeah. Oh, man. That's... <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, yeah, recently I, I, I've just been thinking about this, just kind of like the things that really matter, you mm-hmm. know? And uh, I don't know, I feel very lucky to be able to work with people that I really enjoy working with, such as yourself and the other artists that we've been working with. And, you know, also for the podcast to be able to have these conversations and to dive deep into the minds of other creative people. Totally. Yeah. I agree. I liked, I liked, I don't know if it was you or Justin who said yesterday, like your measure of success is if you're basically not working with assholes. <laughs> and I was that like, was wow. Justin. Yeah. I was like, I mean, I know he was quoting somebody else, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I was like, wow, I must be really successful because I don't seem to work with too many assholes. Like yeah. I, I, everyone I work with is really, really honest and fair and kind. Mm. Um, like noticeably so. I yeah. noticed that for a while and I'm like, well, can't be doing too bad. Like, yeah. But at the same time, you're not an asshole. I'm not an asshole. And I asshole, feel like hopefully. assholes manifest assholes. True. I, yeah. I agree. Yeah. You, know? I, I, you, you get what you put out. You yeah. Know? No, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's something that, you know, we all have to be conscious of is just the energy that we project is the things that we put out, you know, we, we get back as well. And um, to be able to be conscious of that um, energy is, is important. Agreed. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like, um, it, it just affects everything, you know, it's so, it's super important. Like it might be one of the most important things that we can kind of be dealing with as human beings, you mm-hmm. know, it's funny how it's kind of simple too. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. But those things are. <laughs> no, it is simple. And I think like a lot of the times we overcomplicate situations when, something can be much more simplified. Yeah. You know, it's like even um, thinking about, I mean, you can really, you know, think about anything, you know, whether it's like um, changing a diet or changing um, Mm -hmm. just some neurotic things that you do. It's really not, I I mean, yes, I understand that there's certain traumas associated with these things. Yeah. And I don't think that's something to necessarily overlook. Right. You know, because I think everyone has to be truthful with, sort of neurotic processes that they've ingrained in their minds. Yeah. Uh, But it's also very simple to be able to just look at it for what it is. You know, it's like if you're trying to change your diet, well, okay, let's utilize self-control and not eat this thing or that thing. And, you know, it doesn't have to be this um, laborious sort of process. Right. And that can be applied to, I think, a lot of things. I agree. And I think it's also the judgment of how you do it. You know, like if, if it is hard for you to stop eating something or, you know, be anxious, like we were talking about earlier, like kind of accepting that too, like, Hey, this is what's happening. I feel like that's also a moment of like almost being grateful for the thing and seeing it for what it is. Cause I feel like that's the way to kind of change it kind of almost with kindness. It doesn't necessarily mean like, um, it's so easy to change those things, but it's almost like a, giving them some acknowledgement yeah. is like that first step. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I agree. I think it's, it's super important to mm-hmm. do for other people and for yourself. Like yeah. it's, you know, that's the best way to mm-hmm. change. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's also good to, yeah, be kind to yourself and not associate, associate shame with these things that we've built up in our mind Mm -hmm. and to also not shame other people for having those, um, whatever thoughts they may be that have built up over a certain time from maybe it's something they dealt with as a child, or maybe it's something that, you know, that they're just trying to currently work through and, um, and also just giving people the space that you love, you know, Mm -hmm. that sort of unconditional support. Yeah. To be able to allow them to work things out for themselves and not be judgmental about them in the process. Right. I think that's the the best thing that you can give to people. Yeah. You know, I think of um, 
yeah, just certain people in my life that have uh, given me that space and allowed me that space to just explore my own thoughts um, unjudgmentally, you know? Yeah, I feel like, I mean, I know that personally, like in my, gosh, in my personal growth and as an artist, like even as a professional, you know, like there have been a lot of people, you all included, um, that sort of maybe uh, honor and believe whatever path you're on, even if it's going to have a lot of, you know, switchbacks and <laughs> mm -hmm. changes and stuff. Like it's something to, it's not, ever, you know, I understand like some people, you need to kind of let them go on their journey and maybe you're not part of it. Like I also think that's important to understand that some people, you know, gratitude of letting go. Um, but I also think like it's a really beautiful thing when you can, yeah. you know, when you're, when you believe in someone or you have somebody believing in you and they're kind of walking down that path with you, regardless of some of the weird things that can happen on a path. Yeah. Which they will, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I feel like that is, uh, that's a testament of true love Yeah, for someone. Agreed is being able and yeah it's a, you know it's a much more mature approach of of love to be able to accept uh certain people uh, certain decisions that people make along the process and the journey of life and t trying to take uh your own ego out of the equation and take a back seat and just really listen to the other person and allow them to express themselves and um yeah, I've, I've just been thinking about that a lot recently, just the idea of unconditional love and kind of restructuring that in my brain of what that means. And uh, hmm. yeah, and I mean, I'm sure you can, you know, you, you have your, your uh, <laughs> uh, like certain situations that have been dear to you about that as well. I'm sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, I mean, I think it's interesting that you bring up like unconditional love because there's a part of that can, that can kind of, um, it can... I think in some definitions it can turn unhealthy, you know, like like an abuser and the person being abused like unconditionally loves them, you know, like there's there's that side yeah. of it. But I agree with you, like there's also this other part of, um, and so it's hard to define such like big emotions and ideas, mm. but um, I've been thinking a little bit about that too, about unconditional love and how like, you know, for yourself, for another person, for your life, for every moment that you have, you know, that's been really happening for me a lot lately. I think because there's been so much going on recently, like I've had a lot of work stuff. There's been a lot of travel. It's just, it's a busy life, you know, mm -hmm. and like unconditionally kind of loving those decisions and moments that are happening to me as the process is kind of unfolding it's good in, it's a, hmm, how do I say that? Like, it's something I've thought about, but I feel like I'm kind of in it, like needing to really practice that a lot more because it's also really easy, you know, like mm -hmm. when you have a lot of things going on or the person you're with has a lot of stuff going on and there's emotions kind of running high, you know, I tend to get like nervous when I travel a little bit mm -hmm. and I've, been really trying and I think part of that is you know I have a really amazing husband who like unconditionally truly loves me and I love him but also like to show that for yourself you know of like this is where I'm at this is what I'm doing I feel this way and it kind of sucks <laughs> mm. and that's okay like mm. I'm gonna keep walking through it yeah. you know and it kind of like it kind of goes back to that thing we were talking about about like um I guess this is why I brought it up to you. Like hmm. that lady with the, um, the TED sorry, talk. Yeah. The Ted talk with Jill, Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor, where she has a stroke. Um, and she's watching one hemisphere of her brain kind of that judging hemisphere, the left side that's, you know, defining and judging. And it's the separation. It's the thing that like separates objects physically in your mind to keep you safe. It's, it's sort of the survival um, part of our brain. And then she's talking about this other side that kind of took over that isn't as, um, how do you say that? Like 
you couldn't survive with just one, mm -hmm. you know, like she couldn't read a, a card to call 911. She couldn't, <laughs> she couldn't yeah. function. But I was thinking about her, like she talks about that side mm -hmm. and it does kind of fall into unconditional love. Like she's talking about this non-judgmental way of thinking where she's not in the past, she's not in the future. She's right in the present and it's really beautiful and really quiet. Mm. And um, I guess I say that because I've been thinking a lot about like, I I didn't have a stroke, but like 12 years ago, I had kind of this weird experience where I woke up one morning and I had this two week period where I didn't have an inner monologue. Have you ever experienced moments of that where you don't have like all the judging or even just the like multitasking little voice in your head that's like, do this, Yoshino, you, know, you have to, this is the next thing and why are you doing that and you need to stay healthy and you need to do this. Yeah, um, I think I've learned how to flow with it. Right. I don't know if it's, I, I don't think I've ever woken up and it just isn't there, but I have learned to <laughs> sort of sort through my brain to be able to allow myself the space to be able to enjoy the moment. Right. Like sifting through all the words. <laughs> yeah. Just, I, I personally like to, uh, stay really organized mm -hmm. and then, you know, I like to take the first part of the day just to kind of jot through what I need to do or what yeah. I think I need to do. Yeah. And, um, that's helped, but I've never had a situation like yours. So what was that like exactly? It's really strange. Like it's probably the yeah. most spiritual experience I've ever come into. Like I've never ever had. I've had moments of it since, mm -hmm. but to not have any monologue. I remember thinking there's something's wrong. Like, <laughs> but then I was like, but I don't care because this is so great. Mm -hmm. um, of just like, like I didn't want to listen to any music. I didn't want to do. I didn't want anything loud. I remember. I remember I could like when I was painting. I would hear the brush like hitting the canvas and I could hear it like picking up paint which is really interesting I've never thought that picking up paint necessarily made sound but just like super duper present because there was nothing like my brain wasn't anywhere else for like two full weeks it was crazy and then I got like super sick afterwards um which was strange too but hmm. I had this two-week period and I remember just like things are really vivid and really um I don't know how to say it. It's almost like, it's not that they were super calm. Like stuff was still going on. Like people are still honking. I would, for some reason at that time, I think it was cause it was like April, there was all these birds that were like these fledglings falling out of nests. So there was a lot of like dead birds mm. around. So I kept noticing that and like, it was really sad and kind of tragic, but it all sort of fit together. Mm. Like it was just kind of part of what's happening. And I was like, this is amazing. Like if this is how things are all the time, every day they're just it's right there for us to experience of all this like super present beauty mm. you know and and tragic stuff going on and funny things there's a lot of, there's a lot of comedy that I kept finding like in nature <laughs> just like bugs that are fighting and you know yeah. like kind of <laughs> you start watching chipmunks and you're like those are hilarious like yeah. they are the jokesters of <laughs> the forest <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know yeah probably mimics human experiences as well. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like you see the, you're able, your brain is able to dissect the microcosm that is nature. <laughs> in this different way, just yeah. of like paying attention to it. And I think like, mm. like I've kind of in this weird way been always trying to find my way back to that thing, that two weeks. Um, I don't know if that's possible to find your way back. I think it just kind of, yeah. it is what it is. It mm. was the experience I had, but it's a really like, yeah. I remember thinking like, if you don't judge, like that is the one, besides the quiet aspect of waking up and not having all of that shit going on, um, the non-judgmental part, like I was just like, oh, this is what I look like today, or this is what I'm doing today. Like I just kind of didn't, it wasn't a big deal. I didn't like sit there and over process. And I remember like, I've been thinking about that of like how interesting it is like the judgment thing is what sometimes I wonder if it is all the things that cause like anxiety and depression and I mean I know there's a lot of reasons for mm. that but I wonder if it's that part of our brain that kind of 
goes there because I think there's a lot of happiness to be found when it's yeah. not. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of like, um, well, I mean, I have a couple of thoughts on that, but. Uh, I want to hear. <laughs> I mean, I think the interesting thing, my personal studies of psychedelics, <laughs> <laughs> it immediately I mean, I, you know, my, the psychedelic experiences I've had are all with, uh, psil psilocybin mushrooms or a majority of them are with psilocybin mushrooms. But my thoughts on psychedelics is that it's a, it's a, it's like a portal that transports you directly to that childlike state where it's completely a judgmental. Yeah. And also something that I was thinking about in terms of monotheistic religions right, right now, I mean, you bring this up is that time and um so the book of genesis it talks about adam and eve in yeah. the garden of eden and you know you can look at these things as like oh it, it actually happened or mm -hmm. or what have you but i like to look at it more of like the mythology behind it yeah and it's almost as if the serpent in the garden represents the world mm -hmm. and how Adam and Eve are existing with themselves. They are, you know, in complete bliss. The garden of Eden is complete bliss. And it's almost like a representation of your childlike self. And once yeah. the serpent enters in and the sin uh, enters into that and you become, you understand that, oh, wow, we're actually naked. And what is being naked? Right. You're, right? Just, you're, right, you're vulnerable we're, and judgmental and all those things yeah, that are happening. Ex yeah, exactly. And, and, and then, so it's like uh, a representation of uh, humanity in the sense where uh, it, it's this uh, come to consciousness of what it's like to become an adult almost. I mean, you, I'm sure you can look at it from multiple reasons but this is just something that actually just came to mind right now which that's interesting yeah it's interesting is based that, off of your story <laughs> no, that's awesome though yeah. i mean is that something that you've recently like th like that's come to you or is just coming to mind right now no it just came to mind right now okay <laughs> it literally so just came it. to <laughs> mind right now well i mean maybe it's been i i guess you can i i guess i could say that it's been coming to mind mm. since i have understood these biblical teachings of the past, you know, cause I used to, I grew up Christian and, okay. uh, uh, you know, from first grade to a majority of my life, basically. Right. Uh, aside from college and, um, and when you're in high school, but the point <laughs> being is that, you know, I didn't really think of it so much in abstract terms. Right. Um, even if you think of the story of Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, right. and it's really repre a representation of, people over overindulging and you can even look at it in like capitalistic society where uh, people want to consume and basically have a lot of material possessions, you know, yeah. and then like how that was destroyed. Right. But um, no, no, no. It's interesting to think about those, um, those teachings in the Bible as mythology. You know? Yeah. It's, it's interesting because I've kind of, um, I did not grow up Christian. I actually, my parents, are, I don't, I guess you could say they're agnostic maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but they, there wasn't a whole lot of like belief structure in our house. And yeah. so like it, it's always been a little bit foreign to me and I don't necessarily like, I'm not triggered or anything by religion, like any religion it seems like. I just don't have that. I mean, obviously anything in its extreme religion, politics, you know, all those things can be triggering, but just like a, what I see from kind of the outside, it's not triggering in any way, but I always find it really interesting. Like my, my husband, John had somebody in his life that I, I, not, I don't remember who it was, but who told him like, always listen to religious people. And it's like kind of counter cultural now, if you think about that, because I don't know, I live in the Southeast and there's definitely, it's, it's, um, there can be some extremes, you know, of people who really are against religion and have a ton of baggage about it. And then people mm. who are super devoted and, you know, yeah. it just, it like anywhere, but the Southeast is specific to Christianity, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because like, if I, I had kind of the same thing with the Bible, it's not like a particularly present, um, book in my life. But when I started reading it in a way where it was, more abstract and I started thinking about it like what if this is about 
stories about self, you know, like mm-hmm. what if it is about like consciousness or, um, you know, just what happens at, like you said, as a, as a child and then you become kind of open to the serpent, um, like what that looks like. And then it became a lot more interesting and a lot more, like you said, mythology always has this abstract way of pointing to a very human truth. You know, I think that's what kind of you were going into. And yeah. um, mm-hmm. I see that in a lot of those uh, religious writings that I've read. I mean, I haven't read, yeah. you know, as many as I would like. Mm-hmm. But it, But it also... Yeah, I think the interesting thing, I mean, we were talking about unconditional love and how people use these indoctrinations such as unconditional love and these teachings as ammunition to control other people. And I think that's the thing with Christianity historically is that, I mean, even you can look back at the Crusades where they were literally killing people if they're not Christian. Right. So... But I think that also speaks about humanity in general, that people are utilizing these things and these vantage points of power as ammunition to control people. Right. And I think that's also what's interesting about these mythological and biblical teachings. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's when you add into the pot of belief, you add humans (laughs) and things get sloppy. You know, they just get sloppy like human beings. I mean, they're just, they are, Mm -hmm. things get messy and, um, we just, we just are kind of, there's people, I'm sure I have my extremes that I don't even know about that are kind of extreme in my life that I hold to that. And I believe that whatever they are. And, um, it's just interesting. I mean, it's, it's, it hasn't really changed. I don't think in the the history of the world. I think human beings have always kind of hooked into something, whether it's an answer or my way is the right way. And that where that's where things kind of get skewed. I think, I don't think it's the actual like religious texts or, you know, necessarily, I think it's mm-hmm. when you really become extreme about a certain viewpoint of them, mm. you know, just like anything else. I mean, it's the same with politics. It's it's the same with creative endeavors even. I mean, I went to art school. There's definitely a lot of people who think it should be yeah. that way or the highway. You know what I mean? Yeah. And Artistic it's kinda, dogma. Yeah, exactly. It really yeah. is, you know, and, and I don't, I think everybody has the right to their beliefs, but to mm-hmm. impose it on other people is when it gets weird. Yeah. You know? I'm curious because in your online workshop, you were talking about how, you know, these teachings that you've accumulated from going to traditional forms of uh, schools and universities, being able to break that down for yourself. Like I'm wondering how you came to that conclusion to be able to, you know, let the process inform you, but also to know when the the mm. teachings don't serve you anymore. Right. Yeah. It's always like a balance, you know, cause you always, you, um, what is that? There's a prayer in a lot of like, I think it's in 12 step groups. Honestly, it's like the, you know, you're grateful for what's been, what's you, what you've kept and what you've left behind. Um, it's like there, there's this, I don't know for, for, I guess for me, I can't say for everybody, but for me, like I really wanted to take something in when I went to Italy, especially, but I've, I've had a lot of classical training in general mm-hmm. and I think it's good to like totally saturate yourself with something, you know, like let whoever is teaching you really teach you. Like don't try to, especially when you're pretty young, I think it's, it's good, but then there's a certain point and I'm very lucky that I grew up in, you know, I grew up in New York city around a ton of art and a ton of diversity. So I always kind of knew like, I'm going to go here and listen and do what people say and learn this really well, because I think it's important, but I was always like one step out to, you know, mm. um, just a little bit, like I'm going to listen, I'm going to do it. And so for me, like when I started kind of practicing painting on my own, and making my own art and I'm still on that path of trying to figure out what the hell I want to say, mm. um, you know, like where, where it's the muse shows up. Process. Always. And thank God we never get there. Right. Or else yeah. why would we do this? Yeah. Um, but I think like 
for me, there was a point where I, it's like, it's like when you've been wearing something and it just, it doesn't fit right anymore. Like you've just worn it down. Um, you know, and it just doesn't quite fit. Like there's parts of your life and it can be creatively, it can be, um, relationships, it can be where you live. Like there's just a point where something happens and you're like, this is not right for me anymore. Like it just, thank, I mean, I'm so grateful that there are moments like that. And it's sometimes it's not that clear all the time. Like definitely painting for me, having some changes came out of a lot of frustration too, because I was like, I just don't like the way this looks. Like, I don't like the way this looks. I don't like um, the paintings that I was doing were oh, like, I enjoyed them, but they were definitely like their portraits. There was like the, the sort of carrot at the end of the stick was always a likeness. Um, which is really prevalent in a lot of academic art. Um, and it just, I was kind of like, I just don't give a shit that much about this. I mean, I want to, but I just don't. I mean, I really like looking at people. I find them really interesting and I've always drawn people, but this is not the way that I want to do this, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And I think just out of necessity, when you start to want something, but you don't know how to get there, you just try really messy ways to get there. I mean, it was painful at some points, you know, I went through, I'm really grateful that the gallery I work with in, in Charleston, um, Robert Lang, like they kind of saw a good amount of that progress mm. for part of it. Like there was a part where I was like, I'm going to do these like, you know, spinning portraits where everything is blurry. And then I'd kind of be like, well, I don't know, like maybe that's not what I want to do, you know? And yeah. I've kind of, <laughs> changed a lot and I will can hopefully I never stand totally still but I do mm -hmm. like the practice of oil paint has been the consistent you know yeah. the, the love of oil paint the love of like expression and trying to figure out what I trying to figure out what I think about honestly because that's what oil paint does for me yeah um so it's it's just a process that I know I'm gonna you know since I feel like I found two new friends in LA, like, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll come back in like, you know, 10 years and be like, and I'm doing this and I, you know, it'll be completely different yeah. and, and that's okay. Like that's a great path. I think, yeah, I think that's, that's, you have to constantly reinterest yourself and continue to stay curious and, you know, also allow yourself to, you know, not, um, or, or try to sift through the anxiety of, of that, you know, like trying to think too far ahead and, yeah, uh, and be kind to yourself. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's super important. And, um, yeah, I think like just accepting the transitory nature of things is a good lesson. It's a good lesson in life in general yeah. and to, and, you know, and to appreciate things because, you know, even we were talking about unconditional love before and, you know, let's say you're in a, you're in a relationship and you take that relationship for granted. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you just kind of think, oh, well, this person is going to be there for me and, uh, they're right. going to unconditionally love me. So I don't have to try anymore. Right. And, you know, and I think that's potentially, you know, and I guess we can, you know, think of this as like a more mature sense of love and a, and a, and an immature sense of love. And, you know, once mm -hmm. you've gone through those processes of dissecting it, and then understanding what that looks like at the other end. Um, yeah. And it can be, you know, articulated with art or relationships or anything. And I think that's what's interesting about traversing mediums of life in general yeah. and not just mediums of art. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, that's really well put. Um, I follow you on that one. I also think like there's, yeah. there's a reason why there's yeah. a word for love and it's not the same as passion and it's not the same yeah. as comfort. You know, it's different. Like it can't just be comfortable and it can't just be passion. Like love has its own thing, just like um, mm. creativity has its own thing. Like there's this weird yeah. kind of balance where mm. sometimes you're really passionate and then sometimes you're lazy and you don't want to do it and you walk in and fuck all this, you know? And, um, but but it, it has to have all that, like I think inevitably all those things have to have change in them like it's just the nature of the beast right yeah of of everything yeah and i think that's what is kind of lost in our modern culture is the idea of um or i think it's the idea of stillness yeah. that's lost and this overwhelming 
sensation of expendability. Yes. Um, you know, whether that be through social media or other forms of just media in general, news, uh, things are expendable, I feel like, and it's constantly getting ingrained in us because we were inundated by information. Yeah. But I love the idea of, you know, Deep and Corn sitting in a <laughs> studio for hours and hours and just looking at the the canvas. Yeah. And just being like and contemplating. Yeah. His and, phone probably wasn't going off, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he didn't have the like <laughs> Yeah, he probably just he probably just uh, took it out of the, the socket. <laughs> yeah, just doop. <laughs> yeah, and just you know, unplugged it from the socket. He's like, I don't want to talk to anyone today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's like it's it's always. I feel like, um, yeah, yeah I, I I agree. Like that stillness. Um, I mean, even just how we treat like our planet. You know, I mean, you think about all the plastics that get used. And everything's expendable. And I was reading this terrible article the other day about like they found a sperm whale and they had cut it open and there was like 13 pounds of plastic in it. Ooh, and I was geez. like, wow, like we are really, it's gross. You know, there's, there is that mentality of like, um, just, we can, never, we can do whatever the fuck we want. And yeah. I'm cursing a lot. Sorry. Oh, I don't care. <laughs> um, <laughs> You've been warned. This I know. is uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll have an L for language. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, children look away. No, listen away. Yeah. Um, I like how it's called language. Language. It's not I like, know. you know, <laughs> maybe that's what we used to talk like. Everything was just curse words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that's the, uh, the, uh, the genesis of language is curse words. People, people swearing at each other yeah. angrily. I know some painters and then are very close to their origins. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I do think because it's like, I think things balance themselves out, you know, like you've got yeah. things that are ex really expendable and it's everything. Everything is kind of fast paced and, mm -hmm. um, you know, nothing's really important. Like we look at things on a screen and even just today, like going into, I won't say what gallery, but just going into a gallery here and yeah. just being like, oh, these would look better on a screen, but they are terrible in person. Mm. <laughs> just these paintings and um, just how interesting that is, like that, that flip flop that can happen. And then yeah. also when you when you really experience a person or a place, like I, I feel like I've had a lot of that here because mm -hmm. I've listened to your podcast for a long time. <laughs> I've listened to fire trucks. Yeah, I listened to some fire trucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The never ending, uh, every, everyone is hopeless in downtown Los Angeles. <laughs> so true. <laughs> yeah. Everyone needs saving. There's so many cats that are stuck in trees. Uh, my goodness. <laughs> Anyways, hilarious. sorry, what were you saying? <laughs> no, no, I was just saying like how different it is to actually experience something, you know, like to mm. like coming here and yeah. meeting you, mm. you know, and what a like kind person you are and how kind Justin is and just how fun you guys are. And as much as I get a sense of that, like on your podcast and, you know, you, you do get a sense when you are actually in front of somebody and you're meeting them, it's like seeing a piece of artwork in real life. Mm. You know, it really is this like, it's, it can I'll take be, that as a compliment. It is. <laughs> a really good a really good painting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a good painting. Not one of the ones where you're like, oh wow. Yeah. That's better on screen. Um, <laughs> oh wow, this is well, it's a painting. Yeah. <laughs> they use yeah. paint. They use paint. <laughs> Not very well. Yeah. <laughs> no. But then yeah. you get in front of, you know, there's certain yeah. paintings where you see them for the first time and you're like, wow, that is so much better than yeah. like that just is so much more textured and beautiful and you know it just it speaks to this other sense that you just cannot get just from vision like it yeah. ha it has it's almost tactile and mm -hmm. i think that that's something that people are on the other side of that craving more of in some way right now because everything is so fast and so big and so dirty and so you know all yeah. those things like mm -hmm. there are people who are having this conversation you know a lot more yeah and that makes me really interested i don't think it's enough of people that are doing mm. it to actually counteract it yet you yeah. know i think there's like a big wheel that needs to be turned back but um i don't mean that like um mentally necessarily i just mean like a wheel um of like wastefulness and kind of what we're talking about you know yeah. but i think sort of that essence of um maybe a time forgotten yeah yeah. Like I think about, you know, John and I talk a lot about like at home, you know, think about people in like pioneering days. Right. And they, 
you know, night would happen and they would have candlelight and they would write poems and write stories and play music. You know, that's why music is so rich in certain places. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I live at the base of the Appalachian Mountains and Appalachia is really, yeah. it has a really specific music yeah. to it. And I think it's because that type of period probably lasted a little bit longer there because it's so remote. Mm. And I think about that, like, think about how much creativity was happening just because there was nothing to do. You know, it was it was still and it was kind of slow and people were maybe a little bit bored, which I think is great. Like, I don't think we have enough boredom in our life anymore. Like, <laughs> yeah. like I've been thinking about that lately. Like I was looking, I was sitting at a coffee shop the other day and I was like, you know, I could actually say I'm bored right now. I'm watching people, which is not super boring. Yeah. But I was like, I purposely like didn't put my phone because I knew I was coming here and I was going to be painting and talking. So I was like, I'm not going to look at my phone. I'm not going to talk. I just kind of need to you know, ground myself a little bit. And I, it was like an hour that I was there. And so at a certain point you're like, okay, I've done all my mental meditations and, Mm, you know, that's good. I'm just going to kind of sit here and allow myself to be bored. And I think that's really important. Like, I think, you know, they say like people have their most creative thoughts, like in the shower when they're driving. And I think it's because you're just kind of like zoning out, like you're not really doing anything, you know? I mean, that is, I kind of go in and out of this practice, but recently, so I used to do this like years, years ago when I used to live by the beach. Um, but I still train in that same area with my boxing and, Mm. um, I try to a couple times a month, I try to do it once a week, but going to the shore and just sitting there and laying on a picnic blanket and just allowing the um you know the uh the the sea water and the the smell of the sea and the seaweed and and just the feeling of the the grains of sand to like uh i don't know just the the sensation of just being there yeah you know i think is being human yeah it's yeah it just kind of reconnects me i mean you know you can even equate this to like a very large body of water and you understand that you're just literally uh just a speck in the universe yeah and that sort of those sort of ideas but um yeah no it's just good to to be there and it's a good reminder yeah, yeah. it's nice to feel small mm-hmm. right? yeah we mm-hmm. try so hard to make ourselves big yeah but actually it's super comforting to feel small sometimes yeah yeah and i think um yeah that's something it's interesting that I, I, wrote, I wrote something down the other day about uh, we assume that people are weak mm. and appear weak, but they are actually strong. <laughs> but the people that are strong are actually weak, mm. you know, because I see, you know, I go to the gym and I see a lot of people and, you know, no real judgment. It's more so of an observation. But I just kind of think about the internal monologues of people and, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, you see people like. <laughs> and I probably do it too. Where I'm just like kind of check, you know, checking myself out. Yeah, of course. I'm sure everyone does it, you know. But because there's mirrors everywhere. Yeah, and, and I, I, but I look around and I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. You know, like there's all these people that are appear to be extremely strong in the outside, and I wonder what they're like on the inside. You know, like I wonder what their internal monologue is like. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, and what some of these people have been through. You know. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Like. And you can empathize with them. Like here you are in that same spot, you know, in the gym <laughs> yeah. trying to figure it out. And yeah. you've got a totally different monologue in your mind, you mm. know, and they've got theirs. And I agree. Like there's sometimes where I'm like, wow, that person is really insecure. I didn't even, I mean, I'm insecure, but they're really insecure, you know? And you think that maybe like they, you know, they show off a lot or maybe they have this really public life or, you know, whatever that is. And then yeah. you can't tell because I, I don't think it's like your buff and famous means that you're insecure. Like, I don't necessarily think they define each other that way either. No, you know, there's yeah. some really great people who are really mentally solid that are very successful and beautiful. You know, there's yeah. all of that. But yeah. I agree. Like, there's this it's really interesting to kind of like think about that you know that everybody's got their own stories kind of going on and um Mm -hmm. there's like this there is this strength like i've it's 
it's crazy how the universe kind of does this sometimes because I was literally talking this morning to John and Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, it's really fascinating. Like I get super anxious about all of these trips and these professional things that are going on. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I just go through that and I forget that sometimes I can be pretty like mentally grounded in those kind of situations. And I I wonder when it's going to sink in (laughs) that I can actually do some of this stuff, you know, Mm -hmm. like I'm not, I am very um, delicate in certain ways, you know, but then there's other ways where I am grounded and can kind of be present with what's happening. Mm -hmm. Um, And also get very lucky in the sense that I have all these cool people around me. Um, But I just, I was thinking about that, like that strength that can happen sometimes, you know, mentally that people don't Mm -hmm. necessarily always acknowledge, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And I think that's, you know, really just maturing and understanding that the complexity of our minds and just human nature in general, that all things can exist in one at the same time. Yeah. And that, these teachings, you know, there's a lot of books that I read and those sort of things. And, you know, it's like, it doesn't fully get ingrained like all at once, you know, yes. it takes a, it's a process to start ingraining it in the way that you think. And, um, and that's totally okay. Yeah. That, yeah. that's a really smart mentality. What you just said, hmm. I think, I think that's incredibly no. wise. Oh, to just know it's part thanks. of a process. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Guru Yoshino. No. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I've been reading a lot of books. Nah. But um man, there there was there was something that I was gonna say actually that uh Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna ask about just this idea of anxiety because mm-hmm. it came up and you know, we were talking about that, anxiety and depression and I think it's a very important thing to talk about, mm-hmm. especially in a culture that you can filter anything. You can literally put filters on things. You can, right. yeah, the, you the, can curate everything. You can curate everything. And I think it's much better to be truthful and honest, at least with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And the safe people around you, totally. Mm-hmm. You know? Yes. Yeah, so having safe people around you is of the utmost importance. Yeah. You need your people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Everybody yeah. needs their people. Yeah. No, you know what I was actually going to say? It's interesting when the pendulum swings because, you know, you have the mid small to mid sized gallery model mm-hmm. and a lot of artists um, have their loyalties to these galleries because um, that's how you make your living. Right. You know? And then I was thinking about how the pendulum swings and there's this sort of like the antithesis of that and where artists are kind of banding together and creating their own dialogue and their own sort of conversations. And I think that comes from this idea of unconditional love, as long as it's done in, with the right intention. Right. And just this idea of, and that's also with the, the TED talk that I was listening to earlier, is that they were talking about that we're in this state now where everyone inherently feels so lonely mm-hmm. because the idea of the tribe is um, like we've <laughs> di- essentially disbanded from the tribe. Yeah. You know, so we only see things for face value because we see what's out there on social media and um, what uh, whatever else is out there on the internet. And I, I think like we're at the beginning of that conversation where I mean, who knows what that conversation is going to be like in 10, 15 or 20 years about social media. Right. But I have a feeling that part of that is having people, collective groups of people band together that truly love the other people and give themselves the unjudgmental space to be able to express themselves. And yeah, I've just been thinking about that a lot, like yeah. about how, how important that is and, and, and how much, um, I don't know how much I believe in that. Yeah. Same. I think people yeah. like crave, I mean, I think they crave connection and you hear that a lot. I think people also fear it. You know, there's both because mm. if they craved it all the time, then this wouldn't really be a problem. But I think it's the method that it's happening. You mm. know, like the method of thinking that you are connected by literally connecting on the phone, <laughs> you know, in yeah. social media, yeah. which is not real. You mm. know, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's, it's not 
you know, actually connecting in that respect. Um, it's amazing what it can do. You know, it does like form a path for connection, I do think. But yeah, you read about like, you know, there's, we're starting to see like generations of people who have never grown up without social media or phones even, you know, like, I mean, I'm of a generation that, you know, I got my first um, mobile phone when I was like 22, mm. you know, so it was pretty late yeah. and I, and it was in a foreign country. So it was even, <laughs> it was even more confusing, you know, those big like heavy Italy? Nokias. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, nice. Was it the Nokia that has a snake? Oh, yeah. It was like just, oh, it was all of that, like direct from wherever they were from, Sweden or whatever. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah super awkward and clunky. And, you you know, if you want to say hi, you had to like press the button like three times to get to the age, you know? <laughs> yeah. People were really fast at that. I got pretty fast at that. Just I did too. One hand. I was like, did it, did it, did it, it was almost like this weird Morse code. Yeah. Yeah. Morse code machine and thumb. Yeah, exactly. You know? But I think about people who have never had that, like they've always grown up with a smartphone mm. um, and just that like, it'll be really interesting and I hope it's not sad, you know, the level of depression and disconnectedness. Like I hope it, it finds a way to balance itself out because it's kind of leaning in that direction. It seems like with a lot of people feel really disconnected, like you say, you know, and um, I do think people tribe together. I think it's really natural like they tried to find, and I think artists, you know, artists are just people, but I think yeah. they're, you know, it's our job to stare at what's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, we're staring at it. Yeah. And um, I think it's kind of intrinsic to want to have your little tribe, you know, to be whatever that is, safe or comforted or just whole. You mm -hmm. know, I think that's just a natural sort of thing that's going to, I hope it happens a lot more. I mean, in some ways we're so unlimited, like we can fly wherever we want and we can meet people that we've only known from like listening to their podcast, you know, like yeah. that stuff is, is present, which is so cool. Like we yeah. are more connected in that respect. Like the world got a lot smaller, but in this other sense, yeah, like you said, we're just not, we're just using this tool that doesn't actually feel very real, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I think, I think something interesting about that is that uh, social media or these forms of technology can be seen as seeds of communication. And what I mean by that, it's, you know, you're essentially planting a seed, but it's also your job to water the seed. And once that seed turns into a plant, then you need to water it more. So you have to mm -hmm. nurture these relationships. Mm -hmm. And that's just something with human nature in general, but it's something that people have to understand that if you really care about people that that's what you have to do and you can bring it back to like intimate relationships you can bring it back to just humanity in general i mm -hmm. think but um because there's so much inundation of information people don't take the time to water the seed they totally. just plant the seed and leave it there and too many seeds yeah. Too many. My yeah. God. I mean, I think about, you know, however many <laughs> yeah. thousands, tens of thousands of followers, you know, that people have hundreds of thousands. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, I recently I really have been changing like the way I approach social media in, for myself mm. because there was mm. a chunk of time where I was like, oh, it's got to be curated. And I got to really, you know, I got to like all my friends things to be able to see what they're doing. And, and I miss that, you know, but I'm also like, I don't, I don't want to try to keep up with a math equation. Like mm. <laughs> this, this is painful to try to figure out. And I'm not going to keep up with the like thousand people that I follow, I just can't, like, it's gotta be smaller. We've always had smaller tribes. They're not like hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. They're, you know, like 150, or yeah, 150, 100, yeah. you know, 160, yeah. whatever. Like you've yeah. got these, um, there's just a certain amount that you can do. And, and I think if it's too many, it's impossible to water all those seeds. You know, it's just, you don't have enough water, but like, that's so ironic saying that in California with all these fires. Uh, <laughs> like, yeah. no water. Yeah, hey, you don't have water. <laughs> Not enough water here. Yeah. Um, but I think about that, like, just that it's almost impossible. And so I almost want to be like, God, I wish somebody would make a social media where you're only allowed 50 people. 
to follow. Like maybe I should just do that to my own. I guess that's what you could do. Yeah. Um, I just get so interested by people and I'm like, Oh, I'll follow them. That's cool. And then I never see it again, (laughs) you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that can be kind of overwhelming, you know, but I've just, I don't know. I've also been like, I'm just going to try to remember, like meet the people and remember the people that I really want to stay connected with. And hopefully some of the people that I wish I knew are going to come into my life at a certain point And I will have that connection at face to face Yeah, truly. But yeah. I totally agree. Like you have to have that seed and continue to water it. Like it needs to keep going. I think mm. it's just a matter of like downsizing how many seeds you have. Mm. Oh, mm. very Zen. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just float a little bit. Yeah, he just lifted like two inches off the seat. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just float away, kind of like hereditary. <laughs> no, <it's, laughs> oh, I just told it. <laughs> I love and then it. I got creeped out. <laughs> no, I'm just yeah. I just love uh, how you can. I don't know. I just, I think it's really interesting how just by throwing a couple words in there, you can just totally steer conversations in oh my different God, directions. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Floating away like hereditary. Hereditary. Yeah. It's like all of a sudden all these other things like. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Get triggered. Oh man. It's really funny. <laughs> I always end up uh, talking about films on, on the podcast, but um, I did want to reel it back to anxiety and depression because I think that is something that, I mean, you know, we can even go back and bring it back to the tribe and how people are feeling lonely Mm -hmm. and not feeling adequate enough and and those things. But do you know where, what triggers anxiety for you? So I've come, that's interesting that you've like brought that up because it's something that I've been kind of noticing lately where I'm like, wow, anxiety is its own thing. Like there could be say, um, something new, right? Something a little new and a little unknown. And I tend to as extroverted as I can be sometimes with like smaller groups of people, I like showing my work in an exhibition is like having a solo show, I love putting all that work out there. I love that people are enjoying it. I hate actually going to the opening because it's Mm. like front and center. And that part, it's almost like I like doing two person shows better. So I'm like, you can look at that other person too, you Mm. know? Um, But being kind of the center of it is real. I'm grateful for it, but it's like obviously showing up in my life because I need to work on it. And so that will trigger for me a good amount of anxiety or you know, people pleasing or, you know, all that kind of stuff. Sometimes social media will kind of trigger it. Like I have to limit how much I do, but I've got these certain triggers that they're usually um, something to do with like how I am interacting with other people or something unknown for me. Um, And then I also have them creatively sometimes like, fuck, what am I going to paint, you know, or how am I going to say that thing that I'm trying so hard? And is this, is this stupid? Like all that stuff that artists have, you know, that everybody has, Mm -hmm. um, when they put a part of themselves and what they're thinking about out into the world. And so it'll trigger this anxiety. And I've just been noticing that it's the trigger, but it's not actually the thing I end up worrying about. All of a sudden I'll be like, I'm really worried about somebody like breaking into our house or I'll just start like, if it's not one thing, my brain just jumps to the next thing. It just keeps wanting to, and I don't Mm. necessarily say it. Mm -hmm. It just kind of goes through this pattern of like, oh, did I call that person back? I should really like call them back because I don't think I did that. Or did I send that email? Like that, all those thoughts start to get released more often when I've got that anxiety coming up. Mm. There's probably a little bit of social anxiety there. And it's something that like the trigger almost doesn't matter. It's the anxiety itself afterwards. That's kind of until I'm almost through that event, I have it. And it's, it's really weird. Cause I've started to really look at it. I'm like, this is a physical thing. Like mm. my stomach hurts. I'm like sweaty and you know, <laughs> just kind of generally yeah. like not able to concentrate. I'm usually mm-hmm. when I'm not in those modes of anxiety, like I, I think I concentrate pretty well, you know, just from painting. Like I turn off my phone. I, I kind of, I can spend long periods of time concentrating. Um, and, but it's weird because 
when that anxiety hits, I'm like, man, don't send me to the grocery store. I mean, one time I came home with like lentils and a bar of soap. Like I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just my brain was like, I yeah. do we eat? Like, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> what an interesting combination. I know. It didn't go over. It. it didn't go over very well. <laughs> Does, that's interesting because I, I personally associate, well, not necessarily around in Los Angeles, but Mm -hmm. when I used to live on the outskirts of Los Angeles, uh, I would kind of have this sort of meditative approach Mm. like going to the grocery store. Oh, that's so good. (laughs) Well, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's a love of food and and the (laughs) options and seeing what can be created. But I guess I'm, I'm curious, like, is... (laughs) I mean, I, I know you brought that up, like when you have anxiety <laughs> and going to grocery stores in jest, but um, like, what does it feel like when uh, I guess trying to make decisions when you're when you have that anxiety? It's really hard. I have to yeah. stop constantly and be like, okay, I do this thing where I mm. try to feel the bottoms of my feet. It's kind oh, of a meditation for me because yeah. it it literally grounds me. Like grabbing them with your hands? No. If I'm standing, I just direct all my attention to the bottoms of my feet. It's really weird. Um, It's great. It's great though, because it gets me back in my body, you know, because I'm not in my head. It's literally the counter opposite of staying in my brain because I've noticed when I'm in that place and trying to make those decisions, I can't think my way out of it. Like I'm already overthinking. That's generally what anxiety does for me. Mm. And so trying to think more is kind of a stupid, thing to rely yeah. on. So it feels like things are going too fast and it's really hard to make decisions. And I, I almost feel like I become, I'm not, I'm, we overuse the term ADD, like I'm not ADD actually, but um, it feels like I struggle with like focusing on what I need to do or point A to point B, you know, just like mm. that I don't typically have the rest of the time in my life. It's usually like, it was, you know, coming here even like flying to Los Angeles and seeing you guys like I didn't didn't know you I didn't know Justin like I've painted him but <laughs> you know I don't you don't I don't know you guys and I don't know the space I don't know how it's going to go and I'm painting in front of a camera which is super vulnerable and private you know and trying to explain what I do even though I teach a lot it's never totally comfortable mm. and so I had some anxiety about that of like whoa this is I don't know what I'm I don't know what I'm walking into. It's it's a yeah. lot of new elements. Yeah. And I had that anxiety and it's like this, um, it was just, it was honestly, it was hard to pack. Like I remember packing my suitcase and being like, I have no idea what to wear. <laughs> I've like just small stuff like that that's kind of difficult. And I just, everything takes longer because I'm constantly stopping and doing that thing of like, feel your feet, do, you know, just stop and become go into your body, like go for a run, go for, yeah, you know, do something really physical and get back into the rest of, of yourself so that you're not just stuck in your head the whole time. Mm-hmm. That's what it feels like. Yeah, no, I mean, it sounds like, it sounds like you are um, putting yourself in a state where you can utilize that mind body connection. Yes. And you no. know, that's also why physical activity I think is really good for that. Uh, and, and, you know, just so you have, um, an outlet, you know, or even just, you know, like stretching yeah. <laughs> right before you do an, an introduction, no, I mean, I, but I do that kind of stuff too. And I think, uh, I may, I may get, uh, anxiety for cleaning my apartment mm-hmm. and, uh, you do. sometimes, yeah. Yeah. And then I'll just have to be like, okay, I'm just gonna look at things in sections Yes. This section first, then that section, and then this section, and then yeah, yes. and just kind of break down the steps. And that's just, you know, what I do to just organize my brain in general is just, what are the steps today that I need to do? Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm going to do these things. And then at the end of that, I can be done. And I'll be fine. My gosh, the to-do list is so helpful. I mean, it can get overwhelming, but yeah. it's also, if I do that, like what you just said, I, I clean the same way. I'm like, if I think about it as a whole, I get really freaked out and overwhelmed. Like overwhelm yeah. is sort of a default button for me. So I have to really be mindful of it. Yeah. So I have to do the same thing. Like, okay, you're just cleaning this part of the kitchen. That's all you're doing. You know, it's 
the only place you need to be is right here. And that is always helpful if I just kind of break it down into these small little bite sized parts. Yeah. For those of you that don't know, Yoshino and I are only two days apart birthday wise. So maybe this is also a September birthday thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a Virgo <laughs> thing. September, <laughs> September birthday Virgo thing. But also, you know, Steve McQueen, the uh, mm. director, he I was listening to him in, on an interview and he was talking about how cleaning his house to him is a meditative process when he gets stuck in his own headspace. And I've also heard about writers that uh, they have they, you know, the writing and then they get kind of writer's block and then they turn around. I forget exactly who this was. And um, they construct a puzzle. So they have a puzzle on once mm. on like a back desk and then on the front desk they have the writing. You know, yeah. so it's kind of like trying to understand the way that your brain processes things to put yourself in the best environment to be able to create it more fluidly. And then plus, you know, you're talking about you look at the house in sections. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure you can equate that to painting too. Absolutely. Right? You have to kind of look at the, okay this this section needs to get done or maybe i'm going to look at the whole thing and just get the you know block it in and or get the outline and then okay now i'm going to go into these fine details and, oh yeah yeah and right yeah i mean what you said about like how you start your day off with like you know everything that you need to do and kind of your list and how your day is going to look i i do that I wish I did it more with my day, but I do it with my paintings almost every time I come in. It usually goes haywire and I don't have to stick to the plan, but, and, and I'm okay with that now, but it's, I, especially when I work on bigger paintings that are more difficult and they're not going to sort of show what's happening right away. There are times where like I recently did a painting of a it's a self portrait with a dragon kind of coming over my shoulder Mm -hmm. and I'm holding this orchid in my hands. And that was a really hard piece because I just didn't know how to paint it. Like I don't know how to paint any of my paintings most of the time. (laughs) I don't like, I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing, but uh, (laughs) here I am teaching. Pushing around around paint. (laughs) I mean, it literally comes down to that. I'm like, it's just a bunch of pigment in in oil, you know? Um, But I did with that one, there was a point where I was like, I really want this painting to happen. Like I want this to be a thing that goes out into the world. And I just had to come in every day and do a to-do list. Like, okay, you're gonna fix that weird part of this painting and you're gonna really assess like how you construct a tail. And you know, just like very, very, um, very controlled, Mm. which was super useful because there's this whole creative side that can be so wacky and you're just like, I have no idea. Um, It can be really destructive sometimes in a really great way where you're just kind of in the zone and you're just following. But then there's sometimes where you just need to get stuff done. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's super, it, it is really helpful. And it does it, that actually can help me a lot with anxiety as well. Like if I've got something, I break it down like, okay, what needs to happen here in order for me not to press the default button of overwhelm, overwhelm, <laughs> overwhelm, eject, 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 you know? <laughs> and then you just start freaking out and pulling your hair out. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, there's been so many times where I'm just like, I'm just going to cry, yeah. you know? And, and and then you walk your way through yeah. it, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I think it's really important to surround yourself with people who don't add fuel to that. Yes. To that fire. Yes. Who aren't panicking with you. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think it's good. You know, I think it's good to be with somebody who or with people who understand it, but also aren't like, yeah, what are you going to do? You're going to fuck it up. You know, you're just (laughs) like, you're... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> don't fuck it up Mia. don't fuck it up <laughs> yeah um, i kept telling those guys that yesterday yeah um <sighs> but yeah i think it's important you know to be with somebody with people who are like really empathetic to it like they've been yeah. through it themselves but they're yeah. also like you're gonna find your way out of this <laughs> mm-hmm. you will you know you will find your way through this part um and it's okay where you're at kind of what we we're to yeah. circle it back around to what we were saying at the mm-hmm. beginning like I'm always really grateful when somebody is letting letting me go through that because there's times where you're you have anxiety or depression and you you're just in it. Like it doesn't matter how many times you ground your feet and make to-do lists, like you're just you're in and you just need to be allowed that space to get through that without somebody either adding to the fire or trying to fix you. Like you just kind of need to be there are times where I'm like I need to be anxious right now. Like my body needs 
in my mind need to go through this so I can get to the other side. Yeah. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's how, um, a lot of frustrations occur is when, when you don't understand that you need that space or you don't understand what exactly is happening. Mm -hmm. So, or you don't know how to articulate it, you know, because now, you know, you're more mature now. So I'm sure if you were going through an anxious sort of moment and your husband's there and, you know, I'm sure like he, he at this point probably could see like when that oh, is yeah. occurring. He sees it before I do. <laughs> yeah. 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 He sees it. Yeah. He sees it when it's occurring. Right. Or, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I guess just, uh, just giving the, yeah, the person the space to just feel those things and, uh, I'm not quite sure how I was going with that, but <laughs> there, there was there was a point to this. I swear. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was no point to anything, but I don't know. Anyways. <laughs> but, but here we all are. But, yeah, but here we all are. Trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, trying to figure it out. Ah, man. Well. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, this is a good conversation. I know. I could. We could sit here for days and days and people be like just wither no. away <laughs> just, but we would have figured out all the problems with the world oh yeah solved it all yeah no <laughs> yeah i just need two days mm. to think about the problems of the universe yeah then you'll really get anxiety <laughs> i know yeah seriously i mean there's so many just old things within our society that just don't work for us anymore yeah, Edu like, the education system, the the way that we treat homeless people on the street, the any you know, a lot of things, climate, the climate, but you know, and now this begins our two day journey into the mind of ourselves, <laughs> <laughs> of ourselves, yeah, yeah, of ourselves, <laughs> the mind of ourselves, <laughs> and everyone has to listen to it. No, but uh, yeah, no, awesome. I think no. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm yeah. always like so always a little bit surprised and super excited that you want to do this. So thank you. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I really, I respect you immensely for all the creative outlets you have. Oh yeah. Oh, oh man. You, you good you one. Me cry. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. You know to cry. Well, I, I think, um, I was looking at your paintings. The, well, I, well actually I've seen quite a few now. Yeah. And I was telling Justin, I was like, man, no one paints like Mia. Thanks. Yeah. And wow. I, I really like it. Yeah. And, you know, I'm tooting your horn a little bit. I but, know. Thanks. You know, giving you those positive affirmations. Yeah, but thank yeah. Thank <laughs> you. I'm, I'm taking them in. Yeah. Yeah. But no, <laughs> thank no I, you. yeah, you're great. So thank uh, you very much. Yeah. All right. Cool. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I guess this is it. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs>